morning, everyone. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean here at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I want to welcome you to today's conference, Universities and Slavery Bound by History. We are very excited that today actually happened, came. We've been planning this for a long time. We've been proud to plan this conference with the office of Harvard University's president, Drew Gilpin Faust, and with Harvard faculty members, Professors Fenn Beckert, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, and Dan Carpenter, who is also the faculty director of the social sciences at the Radcliffe Institute. I thank them all, along with Radcliffe staff members, Rebecca Wasserman, Jessica Vickland, and Chandra Manning, and their very talented teams for their hard work organizing today's conference. As Harvard's Institute for Advanced Study, Radcliffe's mission is to foster interdisciplinary inquiry into important subjects. We regularly bring leading thinkers together to investigate profound questions like the ones we confront today. How and why have institutions of higher learning been deeply intertwined with the institution of slavery here at Harvard, across the United States, and around the world? And what are the implications of that history? No one academic field can answer such complex and troubling questions, which is why we felt that the Radcliffe Institute would provide an ideal venue for historians, civic leaders, artists, and many others to delve together into the fraught relationship between universities and slavery. I am pleased to share this day with so many of you here in Radcliffe Yard, whether you are a high school student or a scholar of international acclaim, and with many more of you online. A warm welcome to everyone. I hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to visit a special exhibition entitled Bound by History, Harvard Slavery and Archives at the Harvard University Archives, which is located in Pusey Library um, uh, in Harvard Yard adjacent to Widener Library. Ordinarily, this exhibit is open on weekdays, but it will also be open tomorrow, Saturday, March 4th, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. to allow as many of you as possible to view it. I would also be delighted to welcome you back uh, to attend one of the many other public events that the Radcliffe Institute hosts throughout the year. You can learn more about what's coming up from the calendar brochure at your seat and on the Radcliffe website, but I want to take a moment to mention our culminating event of this academic year, Radcliffe Day on Friday, May 26th. This day is dedicated annually to honoring excellence and inquiry and presenting the Radcliffe Medal to an individual who has had a transformative impact on society. This year, we will make history and present two Radcliffe Medals, one to Judy Woodruff and the other posthumously to Gwen Eiffel for their many stellar years as co-anchors of the PBS NewsHour. The day will honor the individual and joint accomplishments of these two journalists and the crucial importance of integrity in journalism. You can find more details on the Institute's website and I hope that you will join us. Today's conference allows us all to participate in an urgent conversation about universities and slavery. Universities propel our society forward through pioneering research and the dissemination of new knowledge. But they are also shaped by their past, both the praiseworthy aspects and the elements we prefer to avoid, including those closely bound up with slavery. Discussions about universities and slavery began on individual campuses. In 2003, Brown University President Ruth Simmons appointed a steering committee on slavery and justice. And in 2007, Brown committed to taking concrete steps to address and memorialize the role of slavery in its history. In that same year, Professor Sven Beckert began teaching an undergraduate research seminar on the history of slavery here at Harvard. Meanwhile, descendants of James Rollins, known as the father of the University of Missouri, established the James S. Rollins a a Slavery Atonement Endowment to support the University of Missouri's Black Studies program. As the realization spread that institutions of higher learning and the institution of slavery shared an interconnected history, many more schools began investigating how slaves and slavery had helped construct 
in all senses of that word, their own hallowed halls of learning. Soon, universities began looking beyond their own campus gates to learn more about the role of slavery in the development of higher education more broadly. Collective efforts have included a landmark conference hosted by Emory University in 2011 and the University Studying Slavery Initiative, which began among schools in Virginia and has now spread across state lines to include institutions throughout the eastern half of the United States. The number of universities coming to terms with this unsettling part of their histories continues to grow. Students in the United States and around the world are asking their schools and colleges to take down statues of slave owning or slave trading founders, rename buildings, and redesign university insignia. Many of you in this, in this audience come from campuses now taking seriously the responsibility of learning what slavery has meant at and for your own institution. Now it is time to make sure that the larger public is included in this important conversation. So I am delighted at the broad and diverse audience that we have gathered here today. In order to move forward, we must first reckon with a complicated past. Through the impressive efforts of many dedicated researchers, we have been learning a great deal about how slavery benefited universities financially and through the labor of enslaved individuals. But we shouldn't overlook how it also influenced universities' intellectual development. Slavery shaped teaching methods, curricula, and the evolution of entire disciplines. Today's conference will take us deep into the consideration of these multifaceted relationships. Let's begin by looking at the cover of your conference program. So if you want to dig that out. The program covers, uh, cover features a portrait of a man named Renty, who was born in Africa, kidnapped, and sold into slavery in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. This image was taken in 1850, when Renty was a slave at Edge Hill Plantation near Columbia, South Carolina. Portraits were chiefly reserved for the well-to-do in 1850. So who took this image and why? It turns out that the portrait was taken for Louis Agassiz, a Harvard professor and a world-renowned scientist in his day. He was one of the inaugural professors at the Lawrence Scientific School, the precursor of today's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences here at Harvard. Some of you, in fact, are watching from Agassiz House, that's our overflow space, where we will all gather later today for reception after the conference. That building is named for Elizabeth Carey Agassiz, herself a teacher, president of Radcliffe College, and Louis's wife. Louis Agassiz was a proponent of a scientific theory that was regarded as one of the most cutting edge ideas of his day, the theory of polygenesis. That theory denied that all humans shared common ancestry and instead posited that different races were actually distinct and unequal species. In 1850, Agassiz traveled to a South Carolina plantation to gather evidence for polygenesis. He observed enslaved workers there, and long after his return to Cambridge, he studied portraits taken of five of the men and two of the women. Agassiz classified and cataloged those men and women by their physical characteristics, in much the same way that he had classified and cataloged species of animals earlier in his career. The image of Renty that you see on the cover of your program and here on the screen is one of those images. To Agassiz, Renty was a specimen to inform the Harvard teaching curriculum and to contribute to the development of the academic disciplines of comparative anatomy and anthropology. Renty's catalog biological characteristics were what interested Agassiz. Today, it is Renty's personal story that interests us. So what do we know about that story? The historical record tells us that Renty was a member of the Congo tribe. The historical record tells us that he spent his days laboring. The historical record tells us that he was a father. 
His daughter Delia also worked at, on the Edge Hill Plantation. Renty was surely much more than either Agassiz's list of characteristics or the bare facts revealed in the conventional written historical record. Much of his personal story remains unknown or pieced together by conjecture because so much has been erased from that written record. But that does not mean that we should stop trying to know more. We have, in fact, hosted two seminars here at Radcliffe on the Agassiz images, one in 2012 and another in 2015. And you can read more about one campaign to elevate Renty, literally, in my note in your program. For many years, the Agassiz images remained hidden in an attic here at Harvard until Peabody Museum staff rediscovered them in 1976. Similarly, the historical tie between universities and slavery has remained buried for years. But that relationship could never fully disappear any more than Renty's photograph truly vanished, even when it was out of sight. Now we must comb through the attics and open the disturbing drawers of our university's past, no matter how difficult. As we do, I trust that we will grow to appreciate more and more how an image like Renty's has significance far beyond the Edge Hill Plantation in Columbia, South Carolina, where he was enslaved. Thanks to our distinguished speakers assembled here today and through all of our efforts, we will and we must continue to unearth this history today and commit to ensuring that it informs our work going forward. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the podium distinguished historian and Harvard University President Drew Gilpin Faust. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I want to express my deepest appreciation to Dean Elizabeth Cohen and her Radcliffe colleagues for taking on my request to sponsor this conference with such enthusiasm and dedication. We are all very much in their debt. I want to give special thanks to faculty conference organizers, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Sven Beckert, and Dan Carpenter, for shaping such a rich program. And I also want to say a special thank you to Megan Sniffen Marinoff and the staff of the Harvard University Archives for their efforts to find our history. These are just in their early stages. They will continue, but the exhibit that they have already um, put together and the things they've already uncovered are the beginning of a very important trajectory of discovery that we will be engaged in. Last April, members of the Harvard Committee gathered together with Congressman John Lewis to place a plaque at Wadsworth House commemorating the lives of four enslaved persons who had, during the 18th century, worked there in the households of two Harvard presidents. This effort was intended to be one milestone in a broader exploration of an aspect of Harvard's past that has been rarely acknowledged and poorly understood. Harvard was directly complicit in slavery from the college's earliest days in the 17th century <clears throat> until the system of bondage ended in Massachusetts in 1783. Then, through financial and other ties with the slave South, Harvard continued to be involved with slavery up until the time of emancipation. This history and its legacy have shaped our institution in ways we have yet to fully understand. Today's conference is intended to help us explore parts of the past that have remained all but invisible. To acknowledge those realities is essential if we are to undermine the legacies of race and slavery that continue to divide our nation, and if we are to commit ourselves to building a better future. Slavery, of course, is part not just of Harvard's history, but embedded in the past of universities across the United States and in the world beyond our national borders. Today, we will also examine this broader context, investigating historical similarities and differences, as well as the range of contemporary efforts to confront slavery's distressing legacies. So we look at both past and present today 
in the firm belief that only by coming to terms with history can we free ourselves to create a more just world. Thank you for joining us in that enterprise. As our keynote speaker, we are honored to have the ideal person to lead us in that work. His many honors and accomplishments are detailed in your program. Please join me in welcoming Ta-Nehisi Coates. Um, I was, um, whenever I, um, and I've been blessed uh, one or two times to um, do things with President Faust, and um, I, I told her that I was going to resist the temptation to gush over her work as a historian. Uh, before I knew uh, President Faust was President Faust, I knew her as Dr. Drew Gilpin Faust through her work, and then I realized she was actually president of Harvard. Um, <laughs> I, I say that not as a, as a, as a um, just as a, as a mere note of, of flattery, um, it is tremendous, tremendous honor uh, to be here. And in many ways, you know, to my mind, it's a, it's a little absurd to have me here as, as your keynote speaker because I, I learned so much from you guys. And I'm speaking about the historians and the sociologists and the academics uh, in the audience and the political scientists. I, um, I've been blessed with this opportunity um, as a writer for The Atlantic Magazine, which has this, this huge platform and this huge megaphone. Um, but sometimes people make the mistake of thinking because it's the first time they've seen something that you're the originator of that work. And um, I want to do, you know, right now what I try to do all the, all the time and disabuse people of that notion. Um, my job, or a big part of my job as I see it, is to really just, you know, use that megaphone to amplify just some of the, the, the great work that, that's happening. Um, when, when I came to the Atlantic, I think I had a, a basic, what one might call a conventional liberal perspective uh, on race and racism in this country. And I, I guess I would have said race at that time. And the basic notion was that black people were a class of people who, you know, for historical reasons, suffered a greater percentage of poverty. And you know, one of the ways to deal with that was if you could direct traditional programs that, that we you know, use for folks that are impoverished towards black folks, then, everything would be okay. But again, largely, you know, from the research of people who are assembled in this room, I, I came to two conclusions. Uh, the first was that black people in and of themselves are a class in America. And that goes across the board for what we consider a conventional class that you can't really talk about uh, an upper middle class, a black upper middle class, and a white upper middle class as though they're somehow equal. You can't talk about a uh, black poverty and white poverty as though those two things are somehow equal. That the very eco ec ecology that black folks exist in, in, in different places is very, very different. Um, I, I grew up in, in West Baltimore. I had two parents in my house. I had parents who valued education. Both of my parents eventually became college graduates. Um, reading was very, very much stressed in my house. Um, but I didn't have a single friend in my neighborhood who was like me. Uh, the vast majority of my friends did not have uh, fathers in their home. A significant number of them didn't even know their fathers. And you know, at my class at school, you know, it, just, it was nothing. There were very few, if any, families like the one you know, I grew up in. Now, my family was unique for other reasons, <laughs> which I've detailed. But just in, in, in that sort of basic sense, what I'm saying is the basic ecology was different. What that meant was the neighborhood I was in, it wasn't the same amount of social capital assembled that might have been true if you had taken that same profile of a family and that family had been white. Uh, Robert Sampson, who is, Rob, are you here? I got a note saying you were gonna be here. I don't know if Rob made it. Oh, there he is there. Hey, Rob, how you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make this very, very, so you know, Rob, Rob is actually, you know, he's been very, very significant. You know, uh, Bruce West and Diva Page and Rob, these people have been very, very significant in me, you know, understanding what I'm gonna try to lay out here. Uh, Rob, in his book, um, Great American City, Chicago and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect, has a chart. And on one axis, you see the incarceration rate uh, from 1990 to 1995. And on the other axis, you see the uh, incarceration rate from 2000 to 2005. And the effect is that the further up you go, 
the axis, you can see people who across you know, those, those two periods have higher incarceration rates. And along the line, you have neighborhoods throughout Chicago. Bunched up way at the top of this line, that is to say, the neighborhoods that have had the highest incarceration rates across this period that Rob is studying, you see totally black neighbors. There are no white neighbors at the top of that line. And then at the bottom of that line, where you see the lowest uh, uh, amount of incarceration rates across this period, it's all white neighborhoods. This, it's not even a bit of overlap. There's no point in which the two intersect. Indeed, as Rob points out, the highest ranked black community has an, an, an incarceration, an imprisonment rate over 40 times higher than the highest ranked white community. It's two different, two different uh, uh, ecologies. It's not the same thing. There is no you know, black middle class neighborhood or black upper middle class neighborhood in Chicago where the effects somehow mirror not even a black, not even a white upper middle class, but a white poor neighborhood. There just is no overlap at all. That was the sociology. And then, then what I got from the history was the reasoning. That this had, that something had actually happened. And you know, when I started, you know, it's this period of study in my life, I had a, a basic you know, understanding that yes, slavery had happened in this country, it was bad. There'd been a civil war, a civil war might have had something to do with it. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of myself. This was not this long ago. I mean, this was like 10 years ago. This is a very, very recent you know, development. <laughs> And then what you come to realize is that, no, 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 it, it, slavery was big business. Like, it actually was big, big, like it was huge. I mean, it's so huge that it's literally impossible to imagine the United States of America without it. Now, that, that sounds rhetorical, and people stand up and they make that sort of, you know, bold claim all the time. But just, you know, if you, I mean, if you talk about, you know, the four million enslaved uh, African Americans in this country in 1860, and again, I feel a bit absurd making this statement to this learned audience, but I'm aware that other people out there are watching up, so. Those four million African Americans collectively uh, were worth $3 billion that period of time. What, what that means, to put that in you know, context and to give you know, some, some sense, just not to make it an abstract number, is if you took all of the productive capacity of this country in 1860, if you took all the banks, if you took all the railroads, if you took all the nascent factors, if you took everything that you might would consider industry and you put it in one pile over here and you put the four million bodies of the enslaved African Americans in this country, black people in this country, they were worth more than the entire productive capacity in this country. It's by far the greatest asset in this country. If you wanted to go and um, find the largest concentration of millionaires and multimillionaires in this country, in 1860, you wouldn't go to New York, you wouldn't go to Chicago, you would not come up here uh, to Boston or to Cambridge. You would go to the Mississippi River Valley. And the reason for that was obviously the business that was conducted there, the business being based on the bodies of black people. I think as this you know, conference illustrates, and as uh, Dr. Faust illustrated, President Faust illustrated in her comments, this was not merely a, a southern problem. 60% of our exports as a country were, were, were cotton in 1860, we're all tied to this. And when you begin to understand it as, as, as business, when you begin to you know, be able to put numbers on it, when you begin to see the huge enterprise, to understand that, that the United States of America was not a country with a little bit of slavery, but it was actually a slave society, when you start to wrap your head around that and, and what that meant, that begins to make connections to you know, where you are now, especially when you can analyze all the attending effects. I, I tell people all the time, you know, we. Um, talk about enslavement as though it, it were a bump in the road. And I tell people, it's the road. It's the actual road. <laughs> it's the actual road. And I know there's like debate, you know, there's this debate right now between historians and, and economists about whether it could have been another way, could you have had America. And maybe you could have, but this is the way it happened. This is the way that, you know, if I, you know, if I could have, you know, would have, should have. This is what happened, though. This is the thing that actually happened. I want to offer, um, going, you know, my, my, my brief, I, mean, I, I just want to offer a, a few suggestions um, for universities you know, who, who, are, who are pursuing this study um, and for anybody that's, that's really interested, for all those you know, who are here who are, who are interested in this study. I think the first thing that's important to do is not to limit the study of enslavement to enslavement. I think that's really, 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 really important. Um, Enslavement is the originating system of plunder, but it, blur it birthed all sorts of other systems of plunder that haunt us up until this very day. 
And I, I want to be really clear about this. When we talk about, um, say, the era of Jim Crow, a segregation that obviously comes directly out of enslavement, oftentimes you know, we, we find ourselves um, appealing to very uh, sentimental language. You know, we, we, we picture uh, enslavement, excuse me, not enslavement, segregation as simply the right of white and black people not to sit next to each other as they are in this room today. And the thing I always try to remind people is that segregation is plunder. It's taking from somebody else to benefit another, another group of people. It is the act of putting folks into a box so that you can better and more efficiently rob them. If you are um, living in Mississippi in 1940 and you're, you're being taxed, and there's a public university that you cannot attend, you, you are being plundered. If you are living in Alabama and you're being taxed for a school system and you don't have the full access to that school system that everyone else does, you're, you're being plundered. If you are living in Georgia in 1950 and you can't go to the, the public swimming pools the way other citizens can and you're being taxed, even if you're not being taxed, I would argue, if I write a social contract, you're, you're being plundered. Somebody is taking from you. And we, you know, we, can we can take this out across the board. I did you know, my own piece in the case for reparations, looking at the housing conditions in the North and rooting you know, the case in that. But the point is to recognize that the plunder of slavery does not, the plunder, plunder of enslavement does not end with enslavement. And those of us who are interested in that are charged with looking past that. I keep using this word, uh, plunder. And I think you know, my second suggestion would be it's very, very important to talk about it in that way. Well, one of the things that happened, and maybe not so much here, but definitely in the grander conversation, racism in this country is seen as a misunderstanding or somehow not, just like bad manners or something. You know, one group of people was impolite to another group of people. It wasn't nice enough. We should have been nicer. If we could have looked into each other's heart, you know, we, 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 we could have, you know, we, we could have been nicer. I, I um, from time to time when I speak, I'll have, um, someone in the audience, especially when I'm talking about reparations or when I'm talking about the Civil War, from time to time there'll be somebody you know, with roots in the South or from the South directly, and they'll say, my great, great, great grand such and such you know, was a Southerner, but they didn't own any slaves. Why, what does this have to do with me? And I, I will tell them repeatedly that that may be true, but I assure you, your great, great grand such and such wanted to own slaves. <laughs> and that's because enslavement was a system. <laughs> It was a system. It wasn't about you know, being nice. It was, the, it was about structures. It was about the way things were set up to benefit one class of people at the, you know, uh, to the detriment of another class. And it's very, very, very important to understand the intentionality of it. To not understand it, it you know, to, to, um, to not speak of it in such a way as though it was outside of our hands, that it was an actual done thing. The third thing is, is pretty obvious. <laughs> Um, I think every single one of these universities needs to make reparations. Um, I think there's just no way. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, how, how you get around that. I just don't. I, I don't know how you um, conduct um, research that shows that your very existence is rooted in a great crime. And you just say, well, shrug and maybe at best say I'm sorry and you walk away. And I think, I think you need to use the language of reparation. I think it's very, very important to actually say that word, to acknowledge that something was done. And these institutions, some of the most elite institutions in our country, are taking active or effective action to make good on that. I think it's extremely, extremely, extremely important to do that. I think, you know, it's not, I don't want to go so far as to say, you know, the research is for naught if that doesn't happen, but you know, as, as a, um, listen, as a country, we, we recognize that our history is important. And we recognize that our, our place in the world and our place in history comes because of the sacrifices and the great deeds of our forefathers. That's why you know, we have a President's Day. That's why we have a Fourth of July. We, we, we say thanks. We recognize the importance of history, and we're big on taking a moment to say thanks. I, I just think it works the other way also. I think when you stand on the backs of other people who have been exploited, you have to, in a moral sense, as any sort of you know, institution that wants to you know, teach young people about morals 
and ethics, you have to do the right thing and try to make some amends for that. I just don't know how you get around that. I don't, in the fourth suggestion, think it's enough uh, for these universities actually to make reparations themselves. Uh, I think they need to urge other institutions throughout this country also to make reparations. I think uh, being here at a place like Harvard or being at a Yale or you know, being at a Princeton or you know, being at a Georgetown or whatever, you're talking about institutions that effectively birth the leadership class in this country. I can remember a time when words like reparations, and maybe even still to an extent today, but I think less so today, um, were seen as like the sort of cockamamie, crazy-eyed you know, things, like you had just suggested you know, human sacrifice or something. That's less so today. It's still a little bit, but it's less so. And I think like these institutions have a responsibility to help make the conversation respectable. Because it deserves to be respectable. It deserves to be respected. Reparations is not even an alien concept. One time I was on the radio, this guy was you know, objecting you know, to this, this language of reparations. And, and I asked him, I said, I said do, do you oppose the reparations that were signed by President Ronald Reagan for the internment of Japanese Americans? Do you, you really oppose that? He says, no, 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 I, I don't oppose that. I said, how then could you oppose reparations for the crimes of Jim Crow housing segregation? That was more recent. How can you actively oppose it? And, and what I got to was the hard part about this is the idea of giving black people things <laughs> or being seen as give, having given, because you're really not giving anybody anything, <laughs> but being seen as having giving black people things. I just a, a brief diversion. I'm sorry, Judith's is taking a little longer than I thought. I'm going to get out of your way <laughs> real quick. But, you know, from time to time I get in these conversations and, and people say, well, why can't we, you know, see our past and see our history in the way that, you know, Germany, you know, has, has you know, come to grips with its history and, you know, if you go, you know, throughout Germany, you can see that, you know, it's, it's this very, very real reminder of everything that happened there. And, and I tell them, yeah, but see, Germany killed the vast majority of Jews living there. They're not alive as an active political force. The problem is black people are still here. They're an active force who can actually do things. And so I think, if anything, that, that hampers you know, uh, the fight for reparations as much as anything. Having said that, I, I really, really believe that you know, it, it really is up to the leadership gathered here today to help the broader country come to understand the struggle and to force, if not force, can we say coerce, can we say uh, uh, coax, you know, other institutions throughout this country to do this sort of research and to try to think about what they owe. Last thing I would say is listen and don't be self-congratulatory and don't get too mad because people are going to be mad at you. And I would submit they're going to be mad at you for good reason. Reparations is not a new concept. It's not even so much that you know, I myself, you know, in my writing, you know, didn't come up with the concept. Uh, the folks in the 80s and the 90s you know, who were, who were lobbying, lobbying for it didn't come up with the concept. In the 60s, it doesn't have its origins there. This goes back to Belinda Royal. We've been fighting this since the 18th century. You know? And so there's a lot of pent up anger. A lot of that is going to be directed at you guys. I'm sorry about that, but one of the worst things you can do is just you know, retreat into your, cell, into your shell. Doesn't mean you have to take every suggestion from every crazy person that comes up to you. But you got to listen. You gotta listen and you gotta hear that anger. It comes from a deep, deep place, somewhere deep in our hearts, even if we don't always acknowledge, acknowledge it. All of us know on some emotional level that we were robbed and that we've been the victims of generational robbery. Now, we don't always have the intellectual tools that the historians here and the academics and the sociologists and the political scientists have helped, you know, and I give all praise for this, to assemble so that we can understand specifically how that happened. But we know it in our heart. And so when you interact with people, you, you might feel a little, bit of, a little bit of that. OK, I'm going to give up this microphone, because I look very, very much forward to uh, talking to Drew and having this conversation. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Tana Hussey. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, I would gush, but <laughs> not you, but I'll refrain. <laughs> but thank you for the kind words about our scholarship collectively and about um, the work that gets done that, that you have 
put to such good use. Um, very challenging talk with uh, a kind of call to action for this group. And I wanted to start with the history part of it. And I've always been interested in how, through, really through the notion of plunder, you situate your analyses in history, but they really come right up to the present. The reparations article with its, converse, with its discussion of um, housing policy and so forth. So how do you see the differential emphasis? I mean, should we be talking more about today or is it all of a piece? And how do we understand plunder that people are experiencing at this very moment through the growing inequality in our society, so much of what the recent political discourse has been focused on? And how much do we focus on origins of it, or are they inseparable? Yeah, I, I And think, how do you think about that when you're doing your own writing and your own right. inquiries? So when I wrote the case for reparations, there, there were a number of people you know, Sandy Daddy down at Duke, for instance, um, who had done, you know, a pretty thorough scholarship on the concept. And one of the most interesting pieces I can't, and I can't even remember where I read this that I came across, was the notion that actually, you know, this, this does not, this conversation does not in any way have to be confined to enslavement, that for instance, housing segregation mm -hmm. could be talked about. And that, that piqued me, but it piqued me, you know, obviously as a piece of knowledge, but as a journalist. Because as, as a journalist, I thought, A, if I'm going to, convince my magazine <laughs> you know, to do something like this and to put the, the weight and the resources you know, behind it to, to make the case. Because if you're going to argue for reparations, you can't do an 800-word column and say, I think this is a good idea. You, know, you have to have the full weight you know, of the thing that you know, you know, a magazine like The Atlantic usually brings, and maybe a little bit more you know, brought to bear. And so it was very, very important for me to A, find somebody who was alive you know, who I actually could make the case on their behalf so that you could immediately get past the notion that, you know, the sort of popular idea, which I don't even know if it's sufficient, but it's always raised that, well, these people have been long dead. But I, I did, you know, when I wrote the piece, I, you know, I said, okay, we're going to start here, but you do ultimately have to go back to enslavement because you have to understand how it happened. Um, so I, I don't think there's a way of getting around it. Um, I, I do think, though, that if you remain too focused there, people just, they just dismiss it out of, out of hand. You know, they, they don't, they aren't able to see how this thing redounded across history. And, you know, for me, the most disturbing part of it, it's every time you don't do something, every time you don't talk about it, it just burrows further and further and further and further in, such to the point that you're at, you know, like those incarceration numbers I, you know, I, I cited, that very much is the legacy of enslavement. Mm -hmm. You know, people have remained within a, a class across generations, you know, and, and subject to certain forces across generations, you know, because of enslavement, because of policies that came after enslavement, because of policies that came after, after the enslavement, but it's all linked. It's like a chain, you know, and, and, and a fact. And, and I, you know, my, my great fear really is that if, if this is not dealt with, this is going to mark us for our whole history. You know, it, it's that deep. It's that profound. It's that threatening. I sometimes am struck by uh, a sense of history's importance because of the desire to avoid it. Mm -hmm. I think about the brouhaha that erupted when Michelle Obama said, my children grew up in, a, in the White House, which was built by slaves. Right. And that was like not allowed to mention. There was so yeah. much pushback about that comment. And so it, it's as if people who may not know any history don't, uh, you know, affirmatively don't want to know history because right. they're afraid of it. So how do we deal with that? The resistance to teaching slavery in the schools mm -hmm. because it's awkward to talk about. The resistance when the National Park Service started bringing slavery into the interpretation right. of sites, Civil War sites and other sites. Right. Um, what is it through things like the Atlantic? Is it? Yeah. Well, I think what what breaks down that resistance. I think the first thing you have to recognize is you're not going to get everybody. <laughs> As you said, there are people who are affirmatively ignorant. You know, it's not merely that <laughs> I don't want to know. It's like my whole identity is staked on me not knowing. I'm not like, and, and I, I don't know that you can just, that's beyond you. That, that's for that person, you know, to decide what they're going to do. But in the middle of that, you know, again, I, I considered myself so good 2008, a reasonably well-read person. 
I had at that point been a journalist for about 12 years. I had written quite a bit about race, but the amount that I, I mean, I'm kind of ashamed, you know what I mean, to, to be honest. And so I think actually there are many, many more people who are gettable, but really, really don't know. I, I just can't, you know, again, when I, when I published the case for reparations, I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, I had never heard of red. I mean, white people, I didn't know this happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a policy that was in every major city. You can literally go on Google right now and find a match. It's not a matter of information being hard to access. You know, it's clear it's not buried away in you know, archives. It's actually very, very easy, easily accessible. But folks just, just didn't know. I, I do think that we may be at somewhat you know, of, of an advantage right now. Because in, in the era of the internet, and I know the you know, internet has all sorts of problems, and social media has all sorts of problems, but the swiftness with which you can access information and just say, here it is. Here it is. You, know, you don't have to wait on this monograph to arrive in two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's right here. You know, we have the map right there. That's what it says, mm -hmm. right there. You know, um, so I, I think like, what's important is to get a critical mass of people. Um, I think it's also important to think long term, to think about fights that may not be solved in our lifetime, you know, that may not be solved in our children's lifetime. Um, there may well be a sense given you know, the current politics of this country to move away from fights because they don't look like they, you know, barely look like they were realizable uh, during the previous administration. They certainly don't look like they're realizable now. But I think you have to realize this is a long, long fight. Like I said, it's been going on since Belinda Royal. You know, who are you to, you know, drop your weapons right now and say, I, I, can't, I can't deal? You know, so I think it's important mm -hmm. to, to keep those ideas alive. You know, I think about the phrase you, you used a few minutes ago when you said, it isn't a bump in the road, it's the road. I think that's part of the effort to deny this history, is to say, oh, that's just a bump in the road. Right. So to establish the roadness of this history mm -hmm. is, it seems to me, an important step that has to be taken in order to have the necessity, urgency of, right. of this understanding. Otherwise, you can just say, oh, that was just something we just don't need to we teach made. about, yeah. something we don't need to think about. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, I agree. And, and again, I mean, the scope of it, I, I don't think people realize, for instance, that like in 1860, most of the people living in, say, South Carolina or Mississippi were, in, so were literally property. But that was the, most of the people, that you can't really talk about any sort of democracy at all you know, in, in that sort of situation that, you know, um, half the people would say a place like Georgia. I, I don't think people like the scope of it. And then they don't quite get how much money <laughs> the North, you know, actually was, even though there were all sorts of comments, actually making off, off of it. And I think also part of this, and honestly, I'm just dipping my toe in this myself to understand this, they don't understand how much, like how the entire West, modern West, is not really understandable without it. Like they just don't, and, and like in a global sense, it's very hard. And one of the things it brings to me is a more philosophical question of is it possible for human societies, for states, to acknowledge these sorts of things? Is, is the blindness, I'm going out there right now, but is the blindness actually kind of necessary? You know, is because I don't, I don't think human societies have ever been particularly good you know, documenting, you know, that they're crimes. And when you're talking about a crime that wasn't just, again, a bump on the road, but something that made you possible, um, that's tough. But then again, you know, we say we're exceptional, so. <laughs> well, just as, as you say that, how do you think about efforts that might be seen as analogous to the one you're asking for? How do you think Germany has no. faced its past in a successful way? I mean, way? again, like, if you destroy uh, the people, you know, or the majority of the people, the vast majority of people, and then you say, I'm sorry, but the people aren't there as an active political presence. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to, to, and we should be really, really clear about what we're asking for. To acknowledge this, I mean, it, it puts tremendous weight on institutions. Um, if you understand that the White House was built, you know, by enslaved people, if you understand that, you know, the mall, you know, uh, was built by, by enslaved people, um, you take a different view, for instance, of statehood for Washington, D.C. Those sorts of things. Like, it throws a light. It makes that very, very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you start to understand, how, is it a mere coincidence that this majority black capital city has no representation? Of, is that a coincidence? Or is something else going on? So it disturbs, like, all sorts of 
other attendant you know, myths mm -hmm. and realities in a way that if you've murdered the vast majority of that populace, it does not. Because what can we do now? Washington, D.C. is no longer a majority of like, oh, well, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it makes, I think the difference is that you have an act, and I, and I suspect it was the same for, you know, to a lesser, in a different way, but for, you know, the reparations that was made on behalf of Japanese Americans, it just, it wasn't the sheer numbers, mm -hmm. you know, existing as, this is a country that had a black president, you know, largely, though well, not entirely, through the voting strength of black people. So African Americans, and we sometimes, you know, don't quite grasp this, but they're a, a very potent political force you know, in this country, not omnipotent, but a very, very potent force. And so the notion that you would hand over more power to that force, I, I think is very, very disturbing to people. So that is not an analogy. I, I think the notion of system is so important here. Mm -hmm. When I used to teach a course on the Old South, I always talked about how it was a system. Right. So you had to understand white family relations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, policing, everything based mm -hmm. on the presence of substantial four million numbers of unf unfree people in that society. So to understand those connections does seem to me critical because yeah. it does define, it does enable you to ask questions about what else, right. what else right. comes here. And I think like part of it is like, um, I think maybe our artists bear some responsibility here. Um, we're getting better about this, but I think depictions of, of the South, obvious, I mean, this is obvious to you guys, but depictions of the South, you know, the antebellum South, um, are part of why people don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gone with the wind, the second most popular book after the Bible, I think. It's some crazy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not a mistake. You know, it's not a mistake. You know, you, you think about film history and Gone with the Wind being such a revolutionary film, and the most revolutionary film, you know, being, you know, uh, Birth of a Nation. I mean, these, these, this is not a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a mistake, you know, and so um, doing the work of altering that, you know, altering how people, see themselves in the past through the arts, I think is actually also you know, really, really important. Mm -hmm. I think another important development in history over the past couple of decades has been the growing acknowledgement and research that is the foundation for that of mm -hmm. the systematic presence of slavery in the North. Right. Because right. it was always the great alibi for the North, as right. Robert Penn Warren put it, oh, you were the bad ones, and right. we were free, and, and we're exempt. Therefore, the nation, in some sense, is exempt, because right. it was only that little bump it in the road. It was sectional. Yeah, it was yeah. sectional. Yeah. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's made a real change, too. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Let me ask about um, the concept of reparations and um, how you think about it. You have the article, The Case for Reparations. Then you have another article called The Case for the Consideration of Reparations. I do. I don't even remember. Yeah. That. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure it exists. <laughs> I'll be the great expert on ta <laughs> and his oeuvre. But in that little piece, it's much shorter than uh -huh. the other one, in case you forgot, <laughs> since you forgot. Um, but in it, you talk about the importance of the discussion yeah. as well as whatever outcome. And you shy away a little bit from being specific about mm -hmm. an outcome. So the word reparations, mm -hmm. to repair, mm -hmm. is, is the origin of it. Mm -hmm. How do we get to repair, to the place where it is repaired? And is it the process that gets us there? Is it the and you, you've been resistant to say it should be X or Y or this payment. Yeah, or this thing. yeah, so I, and I have because it. I think what people do is, um, uh, in order to scuttle the conversation, they say, "All right, well, how would it work?" You know, and they want you, you know, and then they want to have an argument about how it works. And if you can't, you know, demonstrate, you know, a, a full plan, then they say, "Well, we shouldn't even have the conversation." But I think, and I'm not speaking for you know actual, you know academic audiences or classrooms here, but I think actually that is a way to cover for the fact that people don't actually want to talk about it. And the talk, I mean, I, I think like the barrier to reparations in this country is not that there is not a workable way to do this, and I really, really believe it. The barrier is that people don't want to pay and they don't think they should have to. So, you know, when I wrote the case for reparations and in much of my work since then, for me, the most important thing is to make people, first of all, aware of the debt. So people don't accept the debt. You know, so it's like, you know, let's move to this conversation about financing, but you don't even accept that you owe anybody anything. You know, which just, I, I, um, for me, seems a little backwards, you know? Um, and at the same time, you know, again, I, I know that there are many, many, you know, uh, economists, 
you know, who've actually done that you know, sort of work and saying, here's a scheme for how it could work, here you know, are, are certain things. Let me be very clear about something. I do think it involves a payment of money. I just want to be really clear about that. I, I don't think you, know, it's a, it's a, you, know, you can separate it. And you, know, you can have you know, all sorts of debates about, does that mean, for instance, in neighborhoods that were redlined on the west side of Chicago, there should be some sort of targeted funding for those specific blocks? Maybe it means that. Does it mean that somebody like you know, the, the, the lead person I write about in, 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 uh, in my article, Clyde Ross, who was repeatedly robbed, should get an actual check? Maybe it means that. Does it mean that people who can prove, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm confining this because this is where I did you know, my, my primary mm -hmm. amount of research. Does it mean that people who can you know, necessarily prove that they went to try to use the GI Bill to do X, Y, and Z and were denied should get a check? Maybe it does. Maybe it does. But the first thing you've got to do is acknowledge that there was an actual crime before you moved to sentencing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you have to you know, get people to be able to do that. And um, my sense is that the vast majority of the times people say, oh, it's unworkable. My question is, wait, 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 but do you think it's actually old, dog? <laughs> like, are you actually convinced of that? Because oftentimes, you can say to somebody, I have done something to you. I can never completely make it right. But here's what I can do. And if you could even get there, I mean, obviously you can't make, completely make this right. But if you could even get there, it would even be something. I mean, and this is why maybe I got a little over the top, but I was very, very excited to see Georgetown actually do something, anything. I was excited to see something. Does that make it right? Does that make up for everything you know, that happened you know, for Georgetown's involvement in enslavement? No, it doesn't. But it's at least the admission and the attempt, the start, you know, to do something. It also doesn't mean that people shouldn't continue to oppress Georgetown. That's, that's not, you know, it doesn't mean that people should just walk away you know, from that. Um, but at least it's, it's an attempt. You know, and I, just, I, I find it odd what people are trying to do is scuttle the entire conversation. You use the word plunder a lot, mm -hmm. which is a very powerful word. And as I was listening to you just now, I was thinking, we need to have historians of plunder mm -hmm. and really define what the nature of those extortions has been and trace them in a way that makes the power of obligation seem tangible in a sense. I totally, I totally agree. I mean, what, what is the price? Because it surely has to be one if you, you know, are again living in, I, I think Mississippi was majority black until maybe 19, 1930 or so. Um, if you're living in that state and you effectively don't have the ability to vote, which is to say you have no you know, say over how the government uses tax dollars, I mean, that, that has to you know, exert a kind of economic cost, right? I know for, again, for Clyde Ross, what it meant was that folks could come on to his family's property and just basically steal the property and everything that they owned and they had no ability to appeal mm -hmm. to anyone. There must be a way of putting that in economic terms. I, I think that's really important um, for activist reasons and I understand this. Um, I think segregation is often spoken about in, um, in a way that's meant to appeal to people's morality. It's not fair that you and I can't sit next to each other and have a conversation. Well, that, that, that just doesn't, there's something inherently unjust about that. But I think um, at this point you know, in history, there, there probably needs to be a more hard-headed conversation about what segregation, and there might already be one you know, taking place about what segregation actually is. You know, about, you know, what it, again, what it meant. Like what James Meredith was actually doing. You know, it, when I was, and I, I regret this as a young person, you know, thinking about, I could never understand the fight for integration. I could never, like, well, if you sit next to white people, you're going to get smarter. Like, what, what is going on here? And that's because they didn't teach the economic element of it, right? Like, they didn't talk about, you know, what sort of shape these schools were in. They didn't talk about specifically why, you know, the folks, what they wanted was access, you know, equal. I mean, there was no separate but equal. It didn't actually work that way, you know? And so if you are laboring, you know, across generations, um, with unequal enforcement of the social contract, what did that cost you? You know, and I just I, I think that's a really really important question that has to you got to get beyond these sort of you know um, moral and, and sentimentalist you know mm -hmm. appeals. I think. So Tanahasi, something strikes me here as a bit contradictory, which is we've been talking about system, we've been, and what you said just now is that the feeling good about being able to sit next to someone is not meaningful if there's a whole system that surrounds it that's exploiting people. 
Um, but as you talk about reparations, it seemed to me more directed at individuals or particulars rather than systematic hmm. overhaul. And in a sense, isn't the real reparation to break down the systems that plunder and that otherwise it's just a stopgap and plunder will continue? I mean, I, I think I've been thinking a lot this morning about someone I admire enormously, Brian Stevenson. Mm -hmm and what he's showing about incarceration and the kind of modern day slavery as he sees right, it. Right. Um, so if there is a way that some sort of reparation to the person who was redlined is offered and we still have that system of incarcerating black people at such an incredible rate, then we won't have repaired things. So how do we think uh, uh, reparations have to be mm -hmm. systematic in some sense, yeah, and undermine the foundations of this plunder that so you described. I, I think in this particular case, history does give us a guide. If you look uh, across the board, um, after World War II, there were manifold reparations you know, made to victims mm -hmm. of, of the Holocaust. It wasn't merely, for instance, you know, just one, mm -hmm. you know, one client. We did this, X, Y, and Z. There were, there were a, a series of cases across the board mm -hmm. you know, made. Again, you know, I'm, I'm focusing, or in, you know, in that last comment, I focused on housing because that was the one that I focused on, but I would not, that was the one I had researched, but I would not say that to the exclusion of all other cases for mm -hmm. reparations to be made. Um, and I think if you can get, and forgive me if this sounds pie in the sky, but if you can get a critical mass of Americans to understand that this was an across the board phenomenon. Again, I, you know, I, I thought about housing because housing is not just, um, a place where you can you know, make the case where people are alive today, it's a, it's a place where um, it, it is the source of most Americans' wealth. It's how you, you know, assemble wealth in this country. And if you can't do that, if you're prevented from doing that, mm -hmm. while other people are allowed to do it, you know, it's obviously a problem. But I think if you can get the notion across the board that this was robbery <laughs> in every phase, in education, in criminal justice, mm -hmm. in housing, during the period of enslavement, in voting. Like if you can get that kind of manifold idea, then you can have several cases for reparations and probably what you need is several schemes. You almost need a spirit of it. You need the country you know, to acknowledge this is part of our history and we have a responsibility across the board to repair this. Again, it might be individual people, but that's probably not the end of it. Mm -hmm. you know? And I just, I suspect if we started doing this research, um, we could see it. You can see it, you know? Um, how possible it is? Again, I think I really believe it's the work of generations. Mm -hmm. So we're talking today about universities in particular. And when you think about that, you defined a special role, which is our teaching role, our leadership role, our nurturing of leaders role. Um, but there are many other institutions in our society as well that have had past that are embedded with slavery in one way or another. Do you see other institutions that have particular obligations in this space? Yeah, certainly so. I mean, and I think they might have begun to do something about this, but I mean, certainly if you think about uh, what happened in Virginia with mass resistance, you know, wherein you had people responding to Brown versus the board by effectively shutting down the public school system. Mm -hmm. um, certainly that injured you know, some folks, when you think about, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about micro cases, micro quotes here. Uh, when you think about, uh, I believe it's North Carolina, uh, where they, you know, were sterilizing, you know, folks. And I think this is actually, a, you know, they, they recently were very, very successful, you know, with that. When you think about um, John Burge in Chicago, uh, where he was, you know, spent years just torturing people, you know, and, and you know, they made a, a successful reparations claim against you know, the crimes of John Burge. But you look at like, Chicago and you see that like, um, and I'm, this, is, this is like what happened. You, know, you look at what happened with something like with Laquan McDonald and you see the tape of him being shot down. And you know that the officers who were there covered that up. And you know that the person who was chief of police at the time covered that up. And you know that the cover up extended all the way up to the mayor's office. The folks knew, is there something systemic going on there with the police department? I mean, that's, that's an institution. So I, I really think that like, you could probably go across the board and, and study. Now, I'm, I'm putting particular pressure on the institutions because you guys know 
You guys know, you have a knowledge that maybe you know, the Chicago Police Department does not have yet. You know? And so I think it's just incumbent on you uh, to act you know, and to convince you know, uh, uh, places like that and to convince leaders you know, who will go off to be like mayors of Chicago and you know, corporate leaders in, in, in big cities that this is a real, real thing, not just here, but that it's systemic, it's across the board, and they really should have a responsibility to address. I, I think it would make governance um, for people who are fair-minded and good and just don't really have um, an understanding mm -hmm. of history a, mm -hmm. a, a little bit more manageable to understand where this stuff comes from. I think it's a challenge for universities because we're more likely, I mean, we are more likely to have open discussions, we're more likely to have scholars who want to do research and dig into these questions and debate them. And so thinking about how we can influence institutions that are less likely to do that and don't see it as part of their mission will be a, an interesting challenge that you've put before. Yeah, I mean, I think, well. like I said, the easiest place to, to, you know, uh, to start with is, is the students. Um, I mean, obviously there should be more, but I, I think like that's the, you know, I was talking to uh, Craig Wilder who's over here earlier about you know, his book, Ebony and Ivy, and he was saying they had taken it up and it was a class at Columbia now on Columbia and slavery. And I asked him, do they mandate reading the book in the freshman class? You know, because I, I don't, this is just like, I'm not a university president, I'm just talking here. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of think just talking here. I kind of <laughs> think if you're gonna you know um, come to an Ivy League school and you're going to profit from that education and you have not read that book, you have done yourself a, a disservice. So if I were president for the day or for the year, <laughs> I might mandate that every freshman class read that book, or if not that book, something like that. There's no way that I would want to be graduating people from an institution that was literally made possible by slavery. Slavery was the road. <laughs> and have them graduate like, huh, I, know, I didn't know that. Now listen, if they want to be, you know, if ultimately they want to be um, aggressively ignorant or just affirmatively ignorant, there's not too much you can do about that. But I, I wouldn't want the institution to be able to say, um, we did not make a sincere effort to expose every student who came through our doors to this history. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be optional. Shouldn't be an option. So African slavery was the road, as, as you've said so eloquently. But there's a lot of other plunder mm -hmm. in the history of the United States as mm -hmm. well. What, what's the role of other forms of plunder, and what are the responsibilities that we have to, to those and to other groups that have been either systematically or intermittently? Um. Possibly reparations. <laughs> Possibly, Possibly reparations, you know. Um, I, I'm hesitant to speak there because again, my, you know, my, my research and my reporting and my reading was very, very mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't believe that, you know, understanding, like I don't believe this concept should be limited to black people, you know. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I would often, after I published the case, I would give what people, they would say, well, what about the Native Americans? And I would say, I would love to read that piece. I'd love, there should be a piece like that. I, I would love to see it, you know. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's, a, um, my suspicion, my suspicion is that any time you have a, a hierarchical relationship, you're probably taking something from somebody else. Mm -hmm. That it's not incidental, it's not just, you know, um, a mistake. That's what I think. Um, that does not rise to the level of, of, of a publishable piece or something like that, you know. Um, but I, I, I certainly don't think the concept should be limited to, to, to black people mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Nor should it be, by the way, I just want to be really clear about this too, because I know this is going to come up later. Nor should it be limited to African Americans. Again, my research was very, very specific. You know, I, just, I wanted to make the most direct and specific case I should. But I do think it's worth asking a question about the Western world as a whole. You know, I, I think that's a, you know, a, a, a fruitful and an important you know, line of, of research. So ta what's next? Here we are in this unexpected world after the election, where, as you said a few moments ago, this case may be even more difficult to make in the context in which we now find ourselves. Is, how do you see your writing and your mission, in a sense, in the, in the months to come? What, is it to continue to make the case for reparations specifically? Is it to branch out from that? Probably not. Um, pro probably not. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little confused, right? I'm just being honest with you. I'm a, I'm a little confused right now um, because 
not by your question or anything, but just, um, and just you gotta have to bear with me through this. I, I didn't expect any, any of this. I certainly didn't expect all of this. It's certainly an honor to be here. I really appreciate being here, but you, you have to, um, I, I started this as a really, you know, on a relatively, at the time, obscure blog in an attempt to understand the Civil War. It was my attempt. It was just for me. There was no you know, bigger thing that, that, that was coming out of that. And as I read and the thing spooled out, you know, I, I came to understand more and more things. And even up to the point when I, you know, I wrote the case for reparations, it wasn't clear to me that it would have an effect. You understand? Because reparations was and does, this very moment, exist on a particular place you know, uh, way beyond the open window. And so the notion that you know, it would be you know, read and taken seriously and become as successful as some of the things I write would, would end up where they were um, was not something that I, I foresaw. I always tell people writers have to prepare themselves, and academics too, not to be read. Not to be read. <laughs> so I was a little ill-prepared for this moment. And I think if there's anything I'm, I'm struggling to get back is, um, and I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way, um, I didn't begin this to advocate for reparations. And that's not really how writers work. Um, I began with my own native curiosity. And I'm trying to get back to that. Um, I think it's really, really important that I, that I do that. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm not an activist. I'm not an advocate. It doesn't mean I'm not in sympathy with activists and, active and uh, advocates. But I think my work is at its best when I am answering a question that is really, really burning inside of me. The question of reparations isn't too much. I think the answer is pretty clear, actually. And you wrote this extraordinary piece about President Obama, mm -hmm. and were given unparalleled access to him. You had several long interviews with him. Mm -hmm. Would you reflect on that piece just for a moment? And how you see it in the trajectory of your understanding of race in America as you think about the yeah, meaning was, of that first black presidency? It was important. And just to you know, direct it to you know, why, why we're here today, I, I got to ask him about reparations. You know, which was, you know, I, I mean, he, and he talked about it. Like, we talked about it for like a good, if that interview went on for an hour and a half, we probably talked about reparations for 30 or 45 minutes. You know, and Although, as you know, as, as you know, Sandy says, um, do Professor Sandy Dirty says, it, you know, I, I, his answer was not, you know, to my mind, sufficient. Uh, he did say, "Listen, you can make a case for it. That you're not crazy for saying something actually was taken and, and something was to hear somebody to hear an American president actually say that was tremendous to me. It was huge. Again, and I just I got to be really clear about this." When I say that it was tremendous, when I say it, it does not mean that you don't critique people. It does not mean that you back off. But I think you also need to acknowledge the steps forward that you actually make. It doesn't mean you don't need more steps, but I think you need to you know, make those. Um, at the same time, um, in the spirit of what I just said, I felt like he didn't, um, how do I explain this? He had what, what I would say is the conventional, and I think this is across the board, you know, from you know, the Bernie Sanders folks all the way over to Obama to Hillary, all across the, you know, the basic liberal understanding of race is that the way you address it is by addressing poverty. And it's hard to get people to understand. Like when I did the case for race, it was very important for me to focus on black middle class families. And that wasn't to the exclusion of black poor people. It was to say, okay, you know, the, 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 the dynamic here, the conversation here says, if these people play by the rules, everything will be okay. Okay, let's go examine some people who play by the rules then. Let's see how it ended up. And what you find is they got robbed. They acted like, like you know, that, you know, it was not that, you know, the country wanted them to be successful. The country actually resented their success. And that's old. I mean, that's Du Bois and you know, Reconstruction. It's the same thing. You know, it's a resentment of your success. You know, it is not that, you know, hey, you know, if you would just you know, marry and get a job, everything would be OK. No, you marry, get a job, save your money, and you will be robbed. It sets you up to be plundered. It was very, very important um, because it, go, it cuts against the dominant liberal theory that there is nothing specific 
about black people as a class of people in this country. There is not a specific thing that needs to you know, be addressed. And to his mind, he thought, basically, if you could construct a, a, a decent you know, social safety net, you know, a more you know, liberal, more European social safety net, if you could you know, very, very you know, directly you know, enforce anti-discrimination laws, I'm for all of them, for both of those things. And here's where the magic happens. <laughs> And through the individual work of black people, you could close the effort. And I, th I think I said this. I was definitely thinking this. We've been working for a long time, man. You know, I mean, the, the work ethic is not lacking. That's not, that's, not, that's not the missing component here. That's not, <laughs> that's not the missing thing. And that, that was hard to, you know, to, to, to get across. Um, I was very, very grateful for the exchange. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it to me points out how, how far we have to go. I, I you know, engage, you know, um, Senator Sanders on this during the election because if you have um, if you have a candidate on the left, on the radical left, who can't even see this, long way to go, long way to go. I'm struck as you're speaking that in a way Obama's presidency is another embodiment of your argument. He played by the rules. He did. He thought he could. Uh, preside over a post-racial moment. You mm -hmm. remember all the discussion about mm -hmm. we're in a post-racial moment. Mm -hmm. And so what rules did he get to, to take advantage of? Well, he doesn't, didn't get a Supreme Court right. nominee because somebody right. said we're not playing by the rules right. and the whole birther stuff. So in a sense, the argument you had or the disagreement you had with him, I think you won based on his own, the nature of his own. Yeah, he would disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was, yeah, I, I thought so too, by the way. And I raised that. I raised all of these incidents. And I, you know, I very much said, listen, you know, where, and his argument, and maybe to be a politician, you ultimately have to believe this. And I, and I don't mean that in any sort of derogatory way when I say politician. But if you're about the business of convincing people, you have to believe that not just the, the majority of people are decent and non racist but that not even a, 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 an actionable or significant minority are. And so if you talk to him, he would say, well, the problem was Fox News. You know, it was, and I, I agree, yeah, that was part of the problem. You know, um, but and I, think, I think I asked him, I said, yeah, but why are they watching Fox News? There's a ready audience, you know, for this, this kind of argument. It, it came up again, you know, in the election with, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton and the whole, you know, deplorables. And it's like, wait, we, we have numbers on this. <laughs> We have actual data when you have 40% of your voters who believe black people are more criminal. That's kind of deplorable, man. You know, when the majority of the, your coalition believes against all evidence that, you know, the president of the United States, you know, is a Muslim, and by Muslim they don't simply mean, you know, thinks the Quran is very important, but means something else. <laughs> it's kind of deplorable, you know? Um, but we can't get ourselves there, you know what I mean? We just can't, and, and I think, um, what it is is if we, we are, maybe if we acknowledged all of it, like we would go crazy. Like, like maybe we just would like cease to be able to function. Like it's just too, it's, you know, it's too, is it really, really that bad? Was it really, really, yes, it was really, really that bad. You know, um, and maybe, because I have to think, you know, from some perspective, obviously I'm, I'm arguing for reparations, but you know, I, I don't think it's sufficient to say you're ignorant, you don't know, but why? Why? Like, why? Like, if I'm in that position, why would I not want to know what kind of pressures, what kind of stress, you know, does it bring upon, you know, the belief system, you know, that one functions in to actually acknowledge the debt, you know, to say nothing of actually doing something? What, what, what does it actually do? So we are almost at the end of our time, and I just wanted to know whether you come to all this at this moment with a sense of optimism and dynamism <laughs> about where it can go, or if you feel burdened by it in the way you, you know, if you knew too much, it would be unbearable. Well, I don't feel burdened. I mean, I'd, I'd rather know than not know. I'm one of those people. Um, but I just have to say, it's extremely ironic for any historian to ask me if I feel optimistic. Because <laughs> 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 I go out and talk, right, and people say, well, why, you don't have any hope. I say, have you spent any time around any historians at all? <laughs> Like, you're talking about me? Do you read the stuff that these people are writing? I mean, <laughs> Jesus. Um, no, I'm not optimistic. I mean, <laughs> how could you? I mean, I'm not pessimistic. I, I mean, that's sort of, it almost feels like a question of optimism and pessimism. And, and like, it's almost beside the point. You know, um, it is what it is, and people need to act. 
you know, uh, whether I think they're you know, likely to act or, or, or not. And I, I, when I say this, and I've said this before, I, I root myself in the very, very real tradition of enslaved black people in this country. Um, 1619, folks are enslaved. I'm pretty sure they know it's wrong from the moment they're enslaved. And they say it all through the paper. Listen, 250 years is a long time. That's a lot of generations. You know, you can be at certain points and look to the past and see that all your, your uh, ancestors, as far back as you can see, are enslaved. And all your children and grandchildren, descendants, as far forward as you can see, will be enslaved. And in the midst of that, people acted. They did things. You know, uh, when Frederick Douglass, you know, abolitionists stand up, and they say, you know, this is wrong. They're not the first people to do that. Now, we focus on them because it actually turned out to be successful at the end of the day. So it's easy to focus on the successes, but I'm much more interested in, in the failures. I, you know, I think about Ida B. Wells, you know, who with so much courage, you know, argued and pushed and tried to coax you know, the American Congress to do this anti-lynching bill, which it did not do in her lifetime and didn't even apologize until like 2004 or something, long after Ida B. Wells was that, does that mean that her actions were worthless? That mean it, it, it was meaningless. You know, certainly with, in hindsight, you could say, well, one should have been pessimistic about those processes. That's beside the point. You know, you have a moral responsibility to act, to do, to think, to know. What a great way to stop. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>